Thanks for tuning in to the Medivac podcast powered by the Robert Irvine Foundation, whose mission is to support and strengthen the physical and mental well-being of our nation's heroes and their families. I'm one of your hosts, David Reed. And I'm your other host, Christian Myers. Thank you very much for joining us today on the Medivac podcast. If you're new here, and you might be, there's a price for the show. You have to share it with a friend or family member if you get something out of today's episode. Our guest today is Nick O'Kelly. Nick is a uh, former Army personnel he spent about 13 years in the Army. He was a Green Beret that transitioned into being a, uh, an H-60 pilot. So he flew Blackhawks for the last part of his career with the 160th, which is a prestigious Army flight unit. Welcome, Nick. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for coming in today. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Super exciting. Well, we'll dive right into the story and ask you, what inspired you to join the military? I have a uh, very unique story with that. Hmm. Probably, actually, maybe not too unique, but I was in college after high school. I uh, did did all the normal things. Went went to college like I should have. Didn't mm-hmm. really have a desired outcome by going to college, so I partied too much and drank my way out of college after mm-hmm. about a year and a half. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Heard my that. dad. Yeah, my dad told me I'm not paying for this anymore. It's a so. very common thing that we see across military members. I believe it. <laughs> yeah. Just college is not always the, the best choice for some individuals. Exactly. It was the like right idea in concept, but not the mm-hmm. right idea in how I executed. Yeah. Well, wrong time, maybe. Exactly. Right? Yeah. But uh, so I was in ROTC when I was in college, so that exposed me to the military. So when I left school... I came to the realization that I had to do something with my life. Mm -hmm. And so I first went to the Marine recruiter and because Marines sounded cool, right? Yeah, of course. They're they're way cooler than every other branch (laughs) before you're in the military. (laughs) (laughs) So I do that, go to them, and then they tell me, you're not guaranteed a job, you know, like. You can come in the Marines, but you might be a cook or, you yeah. you know, you're, subject, you to what, you. Yeah, you're yeah. subject to whatever the Marines That's does. That's terrible. Right? Unless you're infantry, right? Then they'll be like, oh, exactly. yeah, come on in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we need more of you. Yeah. yeah. So I walked down to the Army recruiter and they showed me this cool Special Forces uh, recruiting video mm. after they tried to pitch me on some other stuff. But like, luckily I had good ASVAB scores, so I could have done anything. And um I watched that video and I was like, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. Let's, let's do it. Mm. And the recruiter was like, you sure? Like nobody, nobody makes it that I've put through this. (laughs) This is hard. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. this is hard. And I'm like, all right, let's, yeah, let's do it. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's really my entry to the military story. So I entered with 18 x-ray contract. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, yeah, my story starts from there. Went to Benning, did the whole infantry basic and Mm -hmm. then went up to the Q course at Bragg. Nice. And, and how did that training go through for you? Any recycles, injuries? No. So I was, Damn. yeah, so I was, uh, nice. I was fortunate to not get injured at all. Yeah. Um, and I had like a pretty s- solid running background, mm-hmm. which goes so as you guys know, goes so far in the military. Yeah. yeah. So I was running like, I don't want to brag, but 11 minute, two miles when I came in the army. Mm-hmm. Wow. So I was yeah. just flying, you know, and that honestly translates to rucking and everything else that you do in the military so, yeah. or in the SF. And land navigation course. just crushes a lot of people as well. It does. And I think, I don't know, but I think my like ROTC time actually helped a lot with that. Oh, I'm sure I it had did. that foundation already, mm-hmm. whereas the other guys were just coming in straight raw yeah. mm-hmm. and had no exposure to it. Mm-hmm. Makes you know? sense. So at least I had like the basic map reading skills and mm-hmm. yeah, had done it before. So that goes through, you get go through training without a hitch. And what's next? Yeah, so graduated 2012 from the Q course Mm -hmm. um, as an 18 Charlie, which Mm -hmm. is like the demo engineer. um, And spoke Korean, kind of, if you can call it speaking Korean. Mm -hmm. It was enough to pass the test. Yeah. (laughs) So that put me out in a first group, so that's Asia. um, And I went out to Okinawa, which is 1st Battalion. Okay. So I spent three years on an ODA out there. And got to travel all of Asia, really. It was mm. a really awesome experience. Like, got to see different cultures. And mm. it's cool seeing how third world countries and their cultures, like, live, you yeah. know, compared to how we do over here. I mean, it's yeah. a bit of a, was it your first time out of the country or? 
Other than like Canada and Mexico, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you're but those were like vacations, you know. Yeah. They mm-hmm. And those are very Americanized exactly. in their vacation areas. So exactly. Yeah, it gives you some exposure to the world. Yep. Seeing that cultural difference and bringing that knowledge back to the United States is very, very different as well. Um, I mean, and we could have a whole podcast on that <laughs> as well as just like the sense of entitlement that yeah. we have here. Um, and it's it's not even, sometimes it's not even forced. It's just the way of life here mm-hmm. where you have access to everything and you don't have that in a lot of places. Yeah. So, so is... What are like some of the biggest things? I, I just, I'm curious on like what you learned culturally, which kind of translated and helped you um, kind of navigate through that when you got back home. And that probably, is, you already talked about it. Like the biggest thing is just contentment, you know? Mm-hmm. Like they could just have a soccer ball and that's it yeah. to their yeah. name and they have fun with it, you know? Like, yeah. I mean, I'm sure they're not always rainbows and butterflies, but from our perspective, like they're, they're content with that and they're, they're happy with that. Yeah. Yeah. We're here, you know, we're always here. We can't even go out in the rain without, you know, being complaining or our shoes getting dirty. Like, (laughs) nope, exactly. (laughs) And, you know, they're playing soccer in this muddy field with no shoes and, you know, taggered clothes. It it makes, it's very eye opening. Yeah. Makes Um, you appreciative. One of the best things you could do is travel for experience. I agree. and, And to understand that. And I think that's a really huge part of what the audience needs to hear too is like, get out, go travel and see the world before you make an opinion. Right. Right. And you learn like gratitude, right? Mm -hmm. You travel and you're just like, man, we have it made. Mm -hmm. And we don't always think that, right? Like, it's not like every day I wake up and I'm like, oh, I got it made because I'm not in the third world country. But when you're there, yeah, you You see that translated into, you know, those who are very vocal about the politics. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, you go anywhere else in the world, especially third world countries, you're not involved in politics. You're worried about getting through the day. Yeah. Right. What what am I going to have to eat? You know, all this stuff. For sure. And that, that, that is eye opening, but I didn't mean to detract from the story. Um, that's just an interesting one. Just being able to travel very, very young in your career as well. Yeah, it was really nice. And Mm. another thing on that cultural difference is kind of the, the family construct Mm -hmm. like is a little different there, right? Very tight knit. Yeah. Very tight knit. You take care of each other, you know, you take care of your parents, things like that where, you know, my parents live in Seattle and I live in Charlotte. On yeah. The other side of the country. And people and, separate. And I think yeah. that that's, um, we talk about that too, is like the family uh, connection kind of breaks down a little bit now, mm-hmm. especially lately it, where you can have a kid live in, in totally different States. No one's meeting for holidays anymore. Yep. And I mean, to be honest, uh, you, you know, you get, you get other organizations that are influencing the family now mm-hmm. here. Yeah. yeah. I think the community aspect is, is very important. I think that is something that we're missing here something that's fallen off, unfortunately. Like the last time I really saw a community aspect in this country was, you know, 9-12, right? 9-12 syndrome, right? Everyone came together after this big tragedy. We haven't had anything like that really that brought us closer together. <laughs> Good yeah. point. Yeah. And the perfect example of that is if somebody knocks on your door, mm-hmm. you're like, who is that? Instead yeah. of like when we were, you know, when we were kids. Me, I like, run and hide now. I'm yeah. like, is it the cops? Yeah, right? <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> it is like when you have someone knock on your door, you open it and you're like, what do you want? Right. And, you know, I, I see this in my neighborhood. Every neighborhood I've been in, in the last 10 years is, you know, no one's out playing anymore. You, you don't know your neighbors even. Yeah. You don't want to. <clears throat> yeah. You know? Yeah. Because when we were kids, it was like somebody knocked on the door. You're excited. And True now story. it's like, who's there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why are you knocking on my door? It's, it's 7 p.m. Yeah. yeah. What are you doing here? Yeah. So yeah. it's a totally different dynamic. But. Yeah. So, so back to the story here, you mm-hmm. Okinawa, you get to travel all of Asia, which is incredible, especially earlier in your career. Um, you know, us, us army infantrymen, you know, get, especially Rangers, you get, uh, two choices, two States, you know, it's Washington or Georgia <laughs> yeah, and, uh, a choice. <laughs> yeah. And you get, a, you know, two choices, maybe if you're lucky. Right. Um, but yeah, so you're traveling around, and what does that look like? This is year 2012? 2012 is when I got to When you get to your one. unit. Yep. And I mean, things are in full bore. Like, we just had initiated the second surge of mm-hmm. Afghanistan. How was the temperament when you got there? It was actually a little awkward for me because, so my company had just, was in Afghanistan when I got to the company. Mm. So a lot of people think of, one one, which first group, uh, first battalion is not 
like combat, really more JSIT style. But during that era, you know, every group was recycling in and out. Mm -hmm. So they had literally lost somebody in the company, I think a week after I showed up. Mm. So it was very, very, very awkward, you know, being, and there were a group of us, uh, new guys that got there at the same time. So we were all rear D and, um, yeah, it was just awkward. All the all the older or senior NCOs were not accepting of us because mm-hmm. you know when you go on a deployment, you get tight, right? So we were the new guys. Yeah, we're we were gonna get treated like crap anyways, being mm-hmm. the new guys. But this just kind of made it worse, mm-hmm. and you know, so it was it was a little awkward. Mm-hmm. Um, it took a long. I'd say probably a good nine months to actually get over that and yeah. start integrating with them. Usually it was like a trip or two, you know, yeah, and sure. get comfortable. You see them. like a big difference between like pretty much around that time, 2012 to 2015, 16, where you have the senior NCOs um, who have been on multiple deployments at this time. That was just a hard time for people to enter the military. You're yeah. still going, but it's towards the end. Everything's yeah. kind of wrapping up a little bit. And you probably probably got a lot of that. For sure. Being the guy with no deployment patch, no CIB, yeah, you know, walking very, around with all these very cherry. And I, exactly. I'm, sure, I'm sure that you saw that kind of progress as you were ranking up too. Around 2015, when the new guys came in, same kind of concept, I'm sure. For sure, and it's even like that today. I would say, yeah, you know, well, especially now, now. Now you have even senior NCOs who haven't deployed. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. which is very strange. It's a huge shift. That's, yeah. that's very prominent in the Marine Corps right now. They have their whole upper echelon has no deployments or maybe one deployment at best. It's pretty surprising. And, yeah. And yeah. when you know we enter a new combat realm, like we're we're dipping our toes into right now, makes me curious about what's going to happen with that. You know, oh, I know. that's a totally and different landscape. Yeah, I definitely want to want to pivot the conversation into that when the time comes as well as what recruitment looks like now is oh, brutal. Yeah, in the toilet. I've seen some of those stats. It's pretty. <laughs> Scary, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're talking about initiating a new draft and maybe they're not going to be do forward facing, but it'd still be logistics. Yeah. And that is, yeah, it's that's still wrong, scary, right? Because you still that's need wrong. that. Like, it's still important, you know? Yeah. Even though we belittle other aspects of the military, wrongly probably, but <laughs> and, it's still and, important, and right? And as the pendulum swings, it's more and more extreme, right? And yeah. then it, it does find equilibrium. Yeah. And, I think now we're starting to see this. We're definitely seeing this in our first responders mm. is an appreciation for what we so just objected from, mm-hmm. you, you know, police, for instance, defund the police. Now it's like, well, let's fund them up yeah. because <laughs> the crime is exactly. out of control. Yeah. This um, went the direction we thought it would. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Surprise. I know. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Okay. So you get to your unit, you have to, you have to prove yourself, obviously, like anyone else. And what does that look like for you, deployments-wise? Yeah, so I did, um, I don't remember all the exact numbers, but I did a few J-sets to um, Philippines, two to the Philippines. I did one to Nepal, hmm. which was pretty cool. We got to do uh, every space camp while we were there, which was amazing. Very cool. Yeah, getting per diem while <laughs> doing every space camp yeah. was pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, and then I did a combat six month deployment to the Philippines, okay. classified as a combat deployment, but it was more advising and mm-hmm. assisting their uh, special operations guys. Okay, so you're so, out there training them, and yeah, running them through scenarios. Them. Yep. Okay. Helping them with their training pipelines and things like that. And then they were pretty active in combat down in the southern islands of the Philippines. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's pretty some pretty extreme terrorist groups out there. Yeah. So they're still doing activities today, right? Uh, out I'm there? sure they are. Honestly, yeah. I oh, don't it's. Know. It yeah. is dangerous. Sure. Yeah, it's dangerous in some of those areas. Yeah. Can so, you, can you educate uh, people a little bit on on what's you know who the terrorist organizations are out there, or like what, or do you, are you still aware? So, or? I'm sure it's changed a lot. Yeah, because that was in 20, thir- 2013. Okay, so ten. Years so ago, today, yeah. like I, I don't know if I'd be giving out accurate information okay. to be honest. What was the what? conflict that you were facing at the time? So it was a group called Abu Sayyaf. Mm-hmm which was prominent down there. Um, I know a lot of the like backside motivation is the drug running and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Very prominent out there. Exactly. So, but the, I mean the Filipino special operations guys, they were getting 
they were getting their ass kicked. Like mm-hmm. really? it was pretty intense. Um, and they're, they're fighting against guerrilla assets as right. well. Who are so, very well funded for sure with the drug trade. And <laughs> uh, even though the Filipino military is like the guys are, have no quit in them. Mm-hmm. Like their core soldiers are amazing. Mm. They, they don't have the like training that we have. Right. Yeah. Or the resources that we have. So, it's a lot different when somebody's going, um, literally doing CQB with like an M1, mm-hmm. you know, oh, yeah. yeah, like a semi-auto like oh, rifle, wow. mm-hmm. and we got you know we got sexy M4s and everything, yeah, mm-hmm. or scars, whatever, yeah. So it's a totally different dynamic. Can, can you talk about a little bit about the brutality and their methods? So I actually was not exposed to that. Okay. So I. But you you heard some stories. I mean, you were in the unit, right? Yeah, but I don't have any firsthand like yeah. experience with that, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, I was more focused on the operational side or the training side. Well, so to educate everybody, yeah, can, it was brutal. Yeah. It was absolute. It still is to this day. It's brutal in some areas. You don't even want to cross under. It's kind of like uh, old old school Columbia. Yeah, uh, okay. certain yeah. certain areas you just don't go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was in Columbia earlier this year, and it was plenty fine. Like go downtown, Cartagena was fine. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah, no, no problem Definitely. at all. But they said don't leave Cartagena. <laughs> I said okay, <laughs> <laughs> just gonna go on a hike. Yeah, they said do not leave downtown. Like, Got it. <laughs> like little America, right here. Yeah, you're yeah, not allowed exactly. anywhere else. <laughs> yeah. Do not leave. Yeah. yeah. So so Philippines obviously you had you had some sort of uh, package there, your guys were doing their thing. Um, what else, what else, uh, turned about on that trip? So honestly, that was a pretty cush trip. Mm-hmm. Like it wasn't, there was no drama. It and I was, think it's really important to note that like these skirmishes are happening all over the world and we just have this focal point where we think it's the Middle East and that's yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, I know. And everybody always wonders like, you know, why are there people deploying and why are there, you know, why are people still going on, deployments and yeah. it's it's because of that there's always something you know mm-hmm. there's that, that always. misconception that well we're not at war anymore it's like well we're we're at war everywhere right mm-hmm. we just yeah. it just don't know about it and they're usually yeah. proxy wars as well exactly yeah. and if we're not at war we're helping our allies yeah with training or something like that or logistics you know mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, so especially with green berets right yeah i mean exactly. that's i mean that's core competency right yeah, like it's your entire force purpose. multiplier yeah exactly yep yeah which you know, knowing that too, I, I always love to ask this to our Green Berets as well is how is the comfortability level, the differences in culture and training these guys to trust them alongside you? That's got to be a point of contention across the board. Yeah. So I would say that depends on who you're working with. Because mm-hmm. for my, from my experience in the Philippines, those guys, we first group basically stood up some of their special operations regiments. So we're, we're really tight with them. Mm-hmm. Like they're like our little brothers in a way, mm-hmm. you know? So the relationship was great. The trust was great. There was no, no like hesitation to be honest mm-hmm. with those guys. Um, I'm sure other places it's a lot different, but Absolutely. in my experience we were, we didn't have any trust issues or that's good. Yeah. Anything yeah. like that? Well, Afghanistan, Iraq. I mean, there, yeah. was, there was always the constability of green different on blue. story. Right? Yep, because money drives everything there. You know, there's not much patriotism where mm-hmm. there is in the, like I keep using the Philippines because that's my experience. But yeah. they're very patriotic. Like mm. they're they're all about their country. Where in the Middle East, as you guys know, it's more driven by money and other motivations. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. money, religious affiliations, or fear yeah. of. You know, yeah. your Reta- family. Yeah, retaliation. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Things like that. Mm. So, yeah. makes sense. So, go ahead, okay. Christian. Please, please, please after you. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, so you wrap up your time in the Philippines, and that that's your last uh, operation with. Uh, that was my last being in group. Yes, other than a like a trip to Australia for training and okay. stuff like that. But um, yeah. So that so my son was born in March, 2014. Mm -hmm. So I literally left for the Philippines like a month after he was born. Okay. And it was kind of a transition point for me of like, I'm gone so much with this job Mm. that I need to be a parent to at some point, you know? So I started looking 
and I actually didn't mention this, but I was looking at a flight school before I even joined the army. So mm-hmm. I was looking okay. at the fl- high school to flight school program. Yeah. But it was taking so long to go through that process that I just needed to get in. Yeah. So, yeah. So that was in the back of my head. So then I, during that Philippine deployment is when I worked on my flight packet and dropped it. Okay. Um, yeah. I just wanted something in my mind, being a pilot was a little more stable. Sure. And then also looking at like the pay scale of, you know, a warrant officer compared to an enlisted guy, I was like, okay, like, yeah. I'll be doing a little better by my family by for doing, you know, by doing this. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, that was my big motivation to do that. Okay. So you drop your flight packet and your yep. goal, what was your goal to fly H 60s Blackhawks? It, it actually was. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Which is most people in flight school don't say that. Yeah. Don't it, say Blackhawks. Like right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or Chinooks, but yeah. like, yeah, I just love the Blackhawk. It's such a sexy beast. Like, yeah. mm-hmm. It's got the best of everything, in my opinion. Yeah. So, so yeah, it was. I did want to fly Blackhawks. Okay. Um, so I went to Fort Rucker in May of 2015. And then uh, I, um, I ended up being the number one dude in my flight school somehow. So I was a distinguished honor grad. Nice. Um, it's so funny that that you struggled through college and it it wasn't struggling through college, right? It was just the extracurricular activities that got you, right? 100%. Because you got a great ASVAB score, head of your flight class. It's just all about direction and who needs to guide you. And you don't have that really. I was a 4.0 student through high school. Like I was the guy, well, it was almost self-directed or not self-directed. It was like my parents made me do it, you Mm -hmm. know? Yeah. So I had the capability to easily graduate college. I just would party every night, sleep until noon and be like, well, miss class again. Class. Yeah. <laughs> guess, guess it's so too that, late now. That, with that structure and that focus, yeah. you were able to flip it exactly. and come out top of your flight class, yeah. which also gives you a choice. And did you have a choice between an Apache and a 60? I did. So, oh, oh man. Yeah, no, I didn't want to. I didn't want to fly Apaches, man. Have you met Apache pilots? No, I'm, just, I'm, just yeah. I'm just kidding. Who hasn't? Yeah, yeah they'll, they'll let, Yeah, they'll let you know right away. You want to fly Apaches, no, I'm right? just kidding. Yeah, Apaches and CrossFit. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yep. Yeah. That's right. A vegan Apache pilot. That's oh, right. Boy, that's triple trouble. <laughs> yeah, so you choose the yeah. 60. Yeah. And, um, um, I mean, that's got to be an amazing experience getting behind that. It's know? so much fun. Mm. Yeah. The first time you fly it, I mean, you don't know what you're doing, right? Yeah. You, we. So I was the first flight school class in the Army that flew Lakotas. Mm-hmm. Or the oh, yeah. second one, sorry. I was the second class. Okay. So I wasn't, I didn't do the T, the 67, which was like the old school, every, no hydraulics, everything's super hard. The yeah. Lakota was like hydraulics and had some autopilot systems and things like that. So. Mm-hmm. All, of course, all the uh, old school guys are like, you're you're getting out easy, you know? Yeah. You're, you're not <laughs> which, a real pilot. Which Less I, hard I have a problem with that. <laughs> I do too. I have a problem with <laughs> it's that. It's ridiculous. And, and it, like Christian and I talk about this all the time with this new technology that comes available and everybody's like, oh, well, that's cheating. And it's not cheating. It's It's making the fundamentals a little easier for you so that you could focus on bigger picture things, yeah. right? Yes. If we, in, in RASP, we see this as well. We put these guys through a schoolhouse now where they have a month long program to learn what it means to be a ranger. They come in way better educated mm. and yet the old guys are still like, well, you never went to RIP, yeah. you know? Yeah, you went to RASP, back when it was hard. Yeah, <laughs> right. It, hard it's the same thing same with the calculator mentality. and mathematics, you know? Yep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? Well, we're going to these advanced airframes, like we're going to a Blackhawk or an Apache or yeah. Chinook that has all these advanced systems. If you're without systems. hydraulics, right. yeah. so, when are you ever in that situation? Yeah, you so know? why are we training on this archaic helicopter? Yes. Like, I mean, I get the like basic flight controls, mm-hmm. but you you learn that in any helicopter. Yeah. yeah. Like, like you learn how controls. to hover regardless, yeah. you yeah. know? And that's train how you fight. So, exactly. Train how you fight. Exactly what it is. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's it's, interesting. So I agree, you, though. It's funny. Yeah. I don't, I don't get it. It's it's so that you could make room for bigger improvements exactly. and, and bigger strides. So yeah. you're behind this thing, and uh, talk about your first solo flight. How was that? So actually, they don't do solo flights well, anymore. Well, you got you got but your you co like- co yeah. You're behind the first first stick, right? How's yeah. that feel? Yeah. So it was scary to be honest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because you go from this. Um, I don't remember how the weight of the Lakota, but it was probably half the size if mm-hmm. that of a black hawk yeah and yeah it's just intimidating like yeah you're in there the cockpit's totally different you're not used to anything you don't know where 
where any of the buttons are other than just, you know, from your classes. <laughs> yeah. You get the basic classes, so you have an idea, but it's not real until you actually go in. This is a, this is a great example, too, of the future of training. Now we're seeing these, uh, these simulation cockpits that you could go in, learn, get hundreds of hours before you even get, you know, behind that rotor. For sure. But I will say the simulators don't, like some of them, they're good, but mm -hmm. they're not even close to the same. Yeah, yeah. the seat like, of the pants thing, right? Yeah, for sure. Who's like that? picking up that Blackhawk for the talk first time. Talk about in 10 years, though. Let's talk right. about in 10 years, no, 15, sure. 20 years. Now we have VR, you know, and, mm -hmm. and all this all this technology that's coming out that is going to make it easier. Mm -hmm. you, for sure. You yeah. could fly a, you know, a F-35 without <laughs> getting behind it and know the fundamentals first. Yeah. It's pretty crazy, yeah. especially with uh, everything's going digital, even in the cockpit, you yeah. know? Mm -hmm. Like even some of the new like dust landing systems, you know, you're flying instruments, which means you're flying off the screen mm -hmm. from 50 feet down. You're not even looking outside anymore. Yeah. You know, so, so right. A lot of those things you can do in the simulator because of that. Mm. Yeah. Because you're, it's the same screen that you're looking at. The controls might be a little different and you won't feel it as much, but con conceptually it's, it's a good way to train for mm. sure. Fun. Yeah. That's got to be fun. It is. So you do a deployment with 160th. So yep. you get picked up. So after yeah. flight school, did you get your chick your, pick your unit? What was the deal with that? So you get a, I think it's a top either three or five okay. choices, whatever. It's like a OML basically. Mm -hmm. um, and Savannah was definitely one of my top choices, mostly because um, all the other choices weren't that weren't as appealing, you know, as mm -hmm. far as location. And then I also knew third cap was deploying right away. And when you're in flight school, you know, like you're all you little students are so excited to get out in the real world. Right. Absolutely. So deployment is like, yeah, I get to do something yes. real, yeah. you know, spend all this time training. Exactly. So I was really excited for that. And then you also, the career progression is a lot faster if you deploy quickly because mm -hmm. you get so many hours on a deployment. Yeah. So I think I got like, 500 combat hours in nine months or something wow. like that over 500 wow yeah mm -hmm. so it was, really fast it was a lot it was like seven eight hours a day almost yeah almost consistently mm -hmm. other than like rest days but and what was your average duty when you're downrange um so that that was the frustrating thing about the, about the regular army is it was a lot of just moving ass and trash just mm -hmm. airfield to airfield picking up a part you know just doing ring routes so mm -hmm. that was kind of one of my epitomes of like, okay, I need to, this is not what I wanted to do as a pilot. You know, mm -hmm. I could have gone and flown airplanes <laughs> if I wanted to land at airfields. Yeah. So, um, that was my, especially I, with your experience being a green beret. Yeah. You, yeah. And honestly, like in the regular army as a warrant officer, as a new warrant officer, you get treated pretty shitty. Like mm -hmm. it's even like, with that, oh, that yeah. long tab. Oh yeah. Really? I know it was shocking. Which is how many, how many pilots had the long tab? Not many. Yeah. Not no. many. Even yeah. in the, even in the one sixty, like, not off. many. <laughs> I know. I know, man. Like right here. Unfortunately, yeah. I you would, can't haze the hazer, man. Yeah, <laughs> and it wasn't even hazing. I think it's just the nature of the regular army. You know, it, you like, know that that's another thing just, too. Is is that chip on your shoulder? Yeah. Where does that stem from? I don't know. Mm. You know, and everything's so reactive. You mm. know, like there's yeah. no there's no forward looking on anything. It's mm -hmm. just oh my gosh, this happened. We got to do this now, now, now. And it's like, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then let's do it. You, yeah. Know? Yeah. you don't have to freak out about it. Like yeah. Now it's an emergency. Right. Yeah. And it, it yeah. was just constantly things like that. Mm. And then um, you're called a Woj as a, so warrant officer junior grade. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a derogatory term. Um, <laughs> so you're the Woj when you get there, which basically means you're a private. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not, I'm serious because the maintainers, as you know, in a helicopter unit, maintainers are so busy. They don't have time to do the like BS details that nobody wants to do. Mm -hmm. So that falls on the Woges. So the Woges are doing all the, yeah. So, so you go from being from, an E6 green beret, yeah. you know, having fun, you know, shooting guns, blowing stuff up to being this Woj. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're back to the bottom. Yeah. yeah. Back to 6 a.m. PT Ugh. and just And there was, there was, sucking. was there any respect towards what your prior service was or was it just like, a, a little bit, but it's almost like people didn't know what it was, yeah. you know, which is weird. 
Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's bizarre. It says but like, you, you'd cool, be like, cool. you used to be my taxi service, bro. Shut up. Seriously. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. The Uber of the sky. Yeah. <laughs> the sky Ubers. Yeah. Yeah. Uber. yeah. So it was a weird dynamic shift. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you realize that uh, conventional army is not where you want to be. Yeah. Spend a nine month deployment overseas with them. Yep. But you got good good experience. That five hundred hours, like that's that saved me honestly. That's a lot because. Um, We'll get into it later. We'll, we'll, we're going to have to backtrack to talk about like the kind of mental health side sure, of all yeah. this. Yeah. But um, it got me to the point where I was like, it was like a do or die, like get into the 160th or get out of the army. Yeah. Like that's mm-hmm. how fed up I was. Yeah. Just by just the micromanagement and like I said, the react, reactiveness yeah. of everything. Mm-hmm. It was just so frustrating, mm. especially when you have a better answer, but nobody cares. You know, mm-hmm. it's yeah. just, yeah. There's nothing you can do. It's the way we're doing it. Yeah. Yeah, It's the way we've always done it. Yeah. So tail end of that deployment, uh, I dropped my 160th packet because I got 500 hours and you have to be a PC, pilot in command Mm -hmm. as well. So I made pilot in command in Afghanistan. Um, Got back. I had like a month off and then I went to assess, which was perfect because I was in nine month deployment shape. You know? Yeah. So I was like, yeah, let's go, man. Like this is the best shape I've been in in years. So, um, yeah, I went to assess, did their week long assessment, um, and got picked up. I was like the the poster child candidate that you know, like former Green Beret, still young, still like moldable, you know yeah. what I mean? Motivated, yeah. all that good stuff. So so yeah. yeah. So you got picked up into one sixtieth. Can you tell up. the audience what's one sixtieth is so prestigious for? Yeah, so one sixtieth is the um special operations aviation 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 regiment Mm -hmm. um so basically any like major operation not any but most major operations that you've heard of 160th was probably a part of it um the black hawk downs where everybody's going to recognize the 160th Mm, yeah so that was their um obviously one of their biggest like most famous missions yeah yeah gothic serpent yep exactly but yeah it stemmed out of the 101st um so it started at Fort Campbell and then they just started experimenting and basically saying like, Hey, we need, we need a special operations aviation regiment or aviation, um, asset. Mm-hmm. And they just started a program out of the 101st and then it be slowly. And you get a newer, merged. slicker 60. Yeah. That you yeah, got we behind. get the Ferrari of the sixties. Oh, yeah. Brand yeah. new off the line, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes. Yeah, some, yeah, yeah, sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. <laughs> yeah. So what's, what are the salient differences between uh, conventional Army asset and, and the SOAR asset? So you guys have, obviously, much higher qualifications. What do are, what are some of those things include? As far as the helicopter is concerned well, or as far as the training? Yeah, w- whether it's helicopter technology or, or the training, stuff that you can, you know, obviously discuss. Yes. Biggest differences, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the helicopter inside, outside it looks similar mm. other than the, like, probe for HAR. For yeah. all black. Helicopter uh, air-to-air refill. <laughs> yeah, it's all black. Yeah. So it looks looks sexy in that regard. Yeah. Real mean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you look at it. You can I know. see the, the biggest it's, differences between the Chinooks, like yeah. right, conventional. Oh, yeah. And yeah, those yeah. are the, <laughs> the no conventional difference. ones look like an ugly bus in the sky. It's an ugly green bus. And the 160th yeah. ones, you're like, all right, that looks scary. Yeah, it's got a huge, yeah. <laughs> the green Ugh. looks cool when it's off the line, but once it's used, it yeah. like hits the sun in yeah, any capacity. Right. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> yeah, so um, it's a lot heavier. Hmm. So... The regular Blackhawk sits at, I think, 15,000 pounds. Do you, yeah, 16,825 is the yeah, typical. That's right. Like That's like what all the limitations are yeah. based off of. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we would take off regularly over 20,000 pounds. Yeah. Like around 21, 22. So. Yeah. Signif- so that's the biggest difference. I mean, we have yeah. different engines and everything. Sure. Different, yeah. So mechanically, that's it's a big difference. It's funny, the... Uh, the Sikorsky, who makes the helicopter, was like, 16825 is about the max that you should ever put on this helicopter, <laughs> and at 10,000 hours, you should get rid of them entirely. 
And the Air Force and the Army were like, no, nah, your engineers are wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll fly these for 40 years at 22,000 pounds. That's right. Screw your limits. Yeah. <laughs> but that's Watch why they hold my beer. <laughs> they're broken after every run. Right. You know, just I know. like. <laughs> I know. It never yeah. makes you feel uncomfortable about getting in a helicopter. You're like, well, these that's, are supposed to be thrown away 30 years ago. Nah, <laughs> exactly. it just, it just uh, reinforces the idea of how safe they are. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. They do work. They, they're not falling out of the sky very often so yeah that's why you never shut down though on a lay like on a yeah, yeah never you know flight you don't want something to break and have to yeah. <laughs> have to be stuck, there. To get stuck there. so you just keep it running but yeah, yeah. so but then um mission wise is the big difference mm -hmm. with the 160th like and that's where you got your fix yeah that's where i got it in instead of doing Which, ring runs you were yes now dropping off picking up going to the x nice. yeah doing doing the Which real thing is, i wanted to do i mean it, from a pilot's perspective let's talk about that let's talk about landing on the x what that's like what's dropping those guys off right in the heat of it yeah so it's intense um it's a huge adrenaline rush for about a minute 30 seconds mm -hmm. to a minute. But, I mean, you're hearing 10-minute calls in the oh, back. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the radios are nuts. That has got to be exhilarating as yeah, well, where for you're sure. just like, you know, two minutes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Especially your first one, man. Yeah. Oh, with yeah. goggles going, you're just like, yeah. you see the stack overhead. You're just like, yeah, this is, this uh, is it. Like, this real is what deal. I signed up to do. Yeah. So. I always talk about that, too. My, my first experience with that was on a, a, a 60, you know, as a passenger. And, you know, you're like, 10, mi 10 mics out, blah, blah, blah. You're all pumped up and ready. And then you, you, you land and you get out and nothing happened. <laughs> and I was like, I damn it, I'm ready to kill. <laughs> I know. I know man. You get so pumped. It's yeah. funny. Yeah, um, so you have multiple nights like that, more more often than not. For but. sure. It's not not like the movies where you land and there's gunfire and tracers swizzing yeah. past your yeah. head. You land and the helicopter takes off and it's quiet again. Like, right. Oh, yeah. damn it. <laughs> Most of the time, you don't even realize people are shooting at you. You're just like, Because it's so loud. Yeah. You have no idea. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Unless you see like the tracers or the yeah. you know, muzzle flash. Or the, the, yeah. whiz, no idea. the whiz, the yeah. zip by your head. You're like, what was that? Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Dragonfly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <right>. Dragonflies <laughs> out here. <laughs> Dude, I'll tell you one of the funniest things though as a pilot like is dropping off these, you know, elite dudes hmm. into like a HLZ and then seeing the like how – they get out of the helicopter and you just see dudes like tripping and Eat like, shit. Yeah. <laughs> like, that, in the movies, it's so sexy. Yeah. The, <laughs> yeah. Take a That's knee. the worst part, especially it, like in Phil bat, like X Phil out. Yeah. It, it, like it, you just have, you're a hot mess. You got all this gear on, you're, you're trying to rig whatever you have. And we'd have our goggles that were like Velcroed up and you try oh, to yeah. strap them down. But most of the time you're trying to get out of there like a bat out of hell. Exactly. So you just get brown out to the face <laughs> and it is the worst experience ever like you're and like i i would find myself in the beginning just like running like i didn't know where i was going <laughs> i'd be like the helicopter was that way <laughs> oh my gosh it's funny man but it is it is not graceful at all yeah no not at all not it, graceful at all it was great going back and like watching the videos <laughs> yeah, just, dude, this, dude, the, the most yeah. professional dudes yeah exactly in like, the world literally yeah like, or as you like worship you know <laughs> just eating shit. Yeah, just we don't it. tell people that Shh. I know, my bad. Yeah. <laughs> We're graceful. They're great it's after like that. Call of Duty, oh, you just load yeah. on the X. Yeah. <laughs> Which Call of Duty is impossible, by the way. I'm terrible yeah. at it. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. That's see? a tangent, but yeah, yeah, that is. That is. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, um, so that that adrenaline spike has got to be huge, and and you're all of a sudden doing what you wanted to do in the beginning, which yeah. has got to be great. Which is really cool, especially seeing just like the visual of that, you know, of seeing like, I think I was Chuck Four on that deployment and just mm. seeing three helicopters like perfectly aligned, you yeah. know, and all the planning that goes into it. Mm -hmm. Like, as you know, our mission planning is insane. Yeah. Like, it's, it really is insane. We cover yep. every detail, minute by every minute. single detail, you yeah. know, exactly what everything should look like. Mm -hmm. And it's cool to see it happen. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it's really cool to see, see like, it come together. Yeah. And just be executed. Any, flawless. any hairy, hairy situations that you were in on this one? No, not really. Um, hmm. Other than like a couple landings that were a little, you know, less Shady. than ideal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and and that's that's a great point as well. Is you don't have just flat little no. terrain to land. No. You have to worry about. I mean, the noise that that's pushing through. Yep. 
Dust. Uh, yeah. Brown out landing. Dust at night. is yeah. brown Dust out. Dust is real. Yeah. yeah. If there's a lumen at mm-hmm. all, like there's there's all these factors that go into it, and we just think it's it's getting in a getting in your car, turning on the keys, and right. just driving to work. <laughs> yeah. Not even close. I wish. Yeah. But yeah. it's really cool though. Like it's it was really gratifying mm. actually going on the deployment and seeing everything come together. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And, like. The organization is amazing, honestly. I, I'm so grateful for it. But, mm-hmm. but yeah. So you so, got your time in. Yep. And uh, that wrapped up. And what was next for you? Yeah, so then it was a bunch of training, um, going through the progression mm-hmm. in the 160th, trying to become a uh, FMQ is what they call it, fully mission qualified. Mm-hmm. So you start out as a BMQ, basic mission qualified. And then your goal is to make FMQ. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of your badge of honor. That's kind of when you like your you've made it into the unit like mm-hmm. long-term, okay. you know? Yeah. And it's about two years is typically the max um, time to make FMQ. Okay. So I did a bunch of training training and planning, plan X's, things like that. Um, and that's honestly, that's really what they're looking for is the planning side of it. Yeah. Like how can you brief? How can you deal with Now you're on the leadership side right. of things. And exactly. More administrative in the front. Yep. Position. Exactly. Yeah. Cause once you're an FMQ, then it's your cockpit. Yeah. So yeah. you're in charge of the cockpit. So, so you're making all the decisions. And that was the end of your deployments is, is going through this training. So this was the next after, this is basically the first two years you get to the unit. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had about a nine month span after the deployment that I was still going through that. And I actually had my FMQ ride scheduled for April of the next year, this was in 2020, mm-hmm. 2021. It would have been April, 2021. Mm-hmm. Um, however, I needed knee surgery in January that year. Mm-hmm. So I opted to do that, which was frustrating because I had to postpone my timeline. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, ironically, that ended up being like the last time I flew wow. once I got that knee surgery because everything kind of came to light after that or down, spiraled, I guess, if mm. So I think I think that really wraps into the mental health struggles that you had throughout your career. Yeah. And kind of that pivotal moment where you had to decide whether to stay in or get out. Yeah. So how did that look and where did that stem from? So it stemmed from I distinctly remember it was like Halloween time frame after my daughter was born and I was in flight school. So this was 2016. Mm-hmm. Um and there were no there was no ramping up to it or no warning signs. It was literally a punch in the face, like like depression mm-hmm. and suicidal thoughts, like mm-hmm. out of nowhere. It really? was so weird. Interesting. Yeah, literally out of nowhere. I had no explanation for it. You know, there was no compounding things, at least that I was aware of, that led to it. Mm-hmm. Um, looking back now, it's a little easier to like identify, identify all those mm-hmm. things. You know, my daughter was born. I didn't take paternity leave. I kept going through flight school. Um, well, I, also mortality is realized when you had a young one born, I'm true. sure. Yep. So now it's, it's, it's a separation between your military career and your family life, which is being torn in two different directions Yes. is never a good thing. hundred percent. Yeah. And then the aspect of like leaving group and becoming this new private again mm-hmm. in flight school and having to deal with these cadre who were, you know, probably not the best soldiers or individuals. Mm -hmm. That's why they were doing that job. Let let me ask you this real quick is the difference between, uh, conventional aviation and 160th aviation. Did you see a difference in that professionalism across the board? Oh yeah. Yeah. Night night and day. Mm -hmm. Like the, I would strive to say that the 160th might be the most professional organization in the army. I don't know. And maybe not, but up, it's up there. Well, your Be- experience with them because yeah. the maturity factor, like, so most guys in that mm-hmm. unit, at least the pilot from the pilot standpoint have at least eight years in the military already. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, they've done their regular time in the army and most of them were enlisted before. So it's a lot more mature mm-hmm. audience, um, which goes a long way. It I, just I goes say. to show you when we see these special operations units, it's premier, prestigious organizations, you get a certain level of professionalism and it showcases the fact that you don't need 
to haze. You don't need to beat people up and treat them like crap. Yeah. Um, you could operate in a professional sense while still educating these guys into doing the missions they were trained to do. Yeah. And it's it's a lot less of a hostile work environment. Mm -hmm. Which is what the Air Force does, right? Like, I mean, part. I don't know about your experience, but like, that's what they're striving to do. They're striving to make it a more professional organization and it seems to be that way. Yeah, the mm -hmm. Air Force is much like, more like a business right. <laughs> that has guns instead right. of, you know, instead of the, the contrary. Like conventional army tactics do not work on Air Force personnel. You can't threaten somebody. You like <laughs> you threaten somebody, you threaten to haze somebody, like you're going to get in trouble right after that. Yeah. Yeah. It, just, it just doesn't work. But at the same time, like it's the big boy program. Right, and that's the, I think that's the same thing with aviation or special operations. Is you don't have to be here if you don't want to be here. There's the door. Yep. You know th these are the standards. You can meet them or exceed them. And if you fall short, then like get out. Yeah. And how does that affect like morale? I'm just curious. I, I think it's I think it's a net positive. I believe you know. It, yeah. um, I, I never spent time in the conventional army, so I was never really exposed to that other than from the outside. But from an internal standpoint, it's really easy to correct people individually. Like I can have, you know, somebody who's even lower rank than me pull me aside and be like, hey, dude, um, maybe we should try it this way. Yeah. And it's accepted. I know in the conventional army, like E4 pulls E6 aside. Like, nope. Yeah, no, no way. Not no gonna, way. Not going to happen. Start pounding. Yeah and, yeah. and I think that there's a big differentiating factor as well is when you're a line unit or mm -hmm. when you're in infantry position, anything like that where you're forward facing, that has to be reinforced, right? Yeah. There is no time for questions, yeah. especially from those that are lower enlisted from you. Right. You have to rely on the experience of your team and that education that they've been provided for through numerous amounts of training and deployments. Uh, you know, I was, I was a, you know, young enlisted when I took over a sergeant position, I was 20 years old. Yeah. And I'd have, you know, the late bloomers that would come in at 30 years old and they do not like to be told what to do. Yeah. But you have that exact philosophy of if you don't like it, sui sponte, yeah. Yeah. you're out the door. Yeah. You're yeah. done. Goodbye. And um, so you need, you need some structure like that in the right setting. Right. But it also is emphasized and it's multiplied mm -hmm. in the conventional army where that's just the standard. This is how it was taught and this is how it's going to be. Yeah. And I would say the, uh, the fact that in special operations, you can kick somebody out mm -hmm. and it is like an all volunteer force yeah. for yep. the most part makes a huge difference, right? It, it makes all the difference in, in the, the world. regular army or conventional military. They have to cater to the lowest yep. on the totem pole, you know? Yep. So like mm -hmm. if Joe Schmo is notorious for, you know, smoking weed in his room, they have to put something in place so that nobody does it. Yeah, yeah. you know exactly. So that's kind of where it snowballs from. Yeah. True story. Unfortunately, yeah. yeah. But to put it in perspective. I only ever stood somebody at Parade West one time. Nice. And it was because he pulled a gun out, like jokingly. And I was like, "Hey, bud, we're gonna play military for a second. <laughs> Dang. Uh, only ever one time." Only He's ever. like, "What's Parade Rest? <laughs> we don't do and, that in there." And, and no shit. That was like that was the reaction. Was like, "What do you mean? Like, I need you to stand at Parade Rest while I address you right now." He's like. Is that a th like? Can you do that? <laughs> uh, that's funny. <laughs> like, that's uh, that's how the Air Force kind of yeah. works for the most. Part. That's awesome, yeah. but it works yeah. for the Air Force too. It does, and, it you does, know, yeah. I, I tell I so tell, few people. You know, that's my recommendation at yeah. this at the end of the day when people are like, ah, oh, my my son's daughter, or whatever, is thinking about joining the military, Air Force trade skills. Yeah. <laughs> yep, yep. Air <laughs> you know, Force. If yeah. my son ever joins, it's like you're going to the Air Force. Yeah. If you're insisting on joining, yeah. or maybe the Space Force. Who knows? Yeah. Unless oh you, yeah. Unless yeah unless absolutely. Like you got that. Yeah. Now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You like boats or space? Yeah, computers, Space Force. You like yep. boats? Go to the Navy. That's Except, fine. you know, I, I will say is the common mis misconception across the board about Space Force is you're not going to space on secret <laughs> aviation missions. <laughs> not yet. You know, <laughs> not yet. Space shuttle door gunner. You're staring yeah. at a fucking screen <laughs> in <laughs> the middle true. of, you know, Tully Air Force Base, yeah. <laughs> you know, Greenland. <laughs> middle of nowhere. <laughs> that's true. Population 400, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that that's an interesting one. So so back to the mental health aspect of this, you're really, uh, I mean, you get overwhelmed by these emotions that kind of come out of nowhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you address that? I know it's really hard in aviation specifically to go to your leadership about these problems. Yeah, so I, well, the long and short answer to that is I didn't. Mm -hmm. um, I harnessed it all in and tried to like uh, fight stuff it down it. with brown. Yeah, that's what we do, right? <laughs> that's what we're taught to do. <laughs> that's you know? the answer. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I always use this analogy of 
you remember 30th AG first day oh, absolutely. when you get in the army, they separate these kids that are uh, suicidal, right? Or having, oh, yeah. mental there's health, a lot of them, right? And they take their shoe- shoelaces. Yeah. yeah. And that is day one. Orange vest. Yeah. That's day one that we see in the army. Mm-hmm. So that stigma stems from the second we start, mm. not even start basic training, <laughs> like yeah, you're a holdover. That's a really great point is you do see mental breakdowns on a daily basis. And it is, I think that that's such a great point is we see this, we mm. see these actions. This is what it takes. And we always internalize and say, I'm not there. Right. I, and I, how do like, we respond to that? We're the ones sitting there laughing at them, right? Or being like, you know, losers. Like, yeah, I'm, that's not going to happen to me. Yeah. yeah. So then that stigma is born in your head. Like, so then when it happened to me, I'm like, man, I'm not telling anybody about this. I don't want to be that guy, you know. Yeah. You're make fun and, of me. I'm going to lose my job. Right. And, and it's you not question they, yourself yeah. and everything that you stand for at that point. Especially because on the outside looking in, like I had the perfect life, you know, like hot wife, great kids you know, um, crushing flight school, mm-hmm. all these things, you know, physically fit. Yeah. Everything on the outside looked great, but mm-hmm. it wasn't, you know, yeah. it was broken on the inside, but still I didn't want to expose that. And mm-hmm. I didn't want, and all the repercussions of going to behavioral health when you're a pilot, you know, or training to be a pilot. Yes. Yeah. That's a, could be a career ender for so, the most part. Yeah. Right. Like even just going when you're in flight school, they'll be like, you know, we don't, we don't need this guy. And that apprehension mm-hmm. that apprehension is a hard thing to address in that position because on one hand you know you need to take care of yourself you know you're having whether they're you know depressive thoughts that are leading to suicidal ideation or suicidal thoughts if you're having that that's a big problem for you personally and it's something that needs to be addressed but you have this major apprehension like if I address this, I lose everything else that I've been working for. Exactly. And it's it's such a hard decision for people to make. Like we know the right answer, right? The right answer is just to address it early and to get it figured out, but with the consequences that follow. Like it's it's, it's such a crapshoot. It is, because it's so easy to say that now looking back, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, just go get help. Like, what's the big deal? Yeah. You know? But when you're in that moment, you're just like, I gotta graduate flight school. Like this is my career, yeah. you know? Like my family's relying on me to support them financially and everything. Yeah. And I have aspirations to, you know, be a CW five in the army. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to sabotage my career right now. You know, when I still have 10, 15 years left. Yeah. So you, so you locked that in. So I did. Yeah. And for how long? Too long. Um, overall it ended up being like three years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but I tried everything. I tried the meditation route. I tried Mm -hmm. journaling. I tried, um, listening to like sleep music, working on my sleep. So I working out, you know, like I did everything that they say that you're supposed to do. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Other than going to get help. Yeah. It's because of what we already talked about. I didn't want to yeah. jeopardize training. So, um, but they did get to the point where I was so terrified mm. that I, I drove myself to the chaplain mm. and told him terrified like of- this, of my thoughts okay. of these just recycling mm-hmm. thoughts that like, it was this ironic thing because you don't know where they're coming from. Mm-hmm. They just start happening. You can't control them because every time you try to do something about it, you're thinking about that thought. Yeah. So it's this never ending cycle and yep. it's so frustrating and infuriating um, and terrifying. So, Absolutely. so yeah. So I got to the point where I was like, you know what? Like, I'm literally scared that I'm going to do something Mm -hmm. like that. This is going to overcome me. Mm -hmm. Um, So I went to the chaplain. He drove me to behavioral health on Fort. This is in Fort Rucker still. Okay. This is still in flight school. Early. Yeah. Yeah, So this was probably six months after like the onset of it all. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I was just going down this downward spiral just internally though. On the outside looking in, nobody knew anything, you know? So go to behavioral health, which was terrifying for me. Like, you know, it could have gone horribly. Yeah. Um, take this little written survey. Literally it was like a suicide survey. Like, you know, you having suicidal thoughts? Yes. Um, have you made plans to do it? No. Do you want to do it? No. You know, cause I didn't want any of this, yeah. you know, yeah. everything was just there. It was just happening. It yeah. wasn't like, I was like, I didn't hate myself. I knew mentally that my life was great. Yeah. And that was the ironic thing yeah. is like, I was like, why is this happening? Because my life is good. You know, yeah. like 
I have everything I could ask for. Truly but a it, But it was still happening, you mm-hmm. know, so that was so frustrating. So anyways, I go do that survey. They bring me back and I talk to a lady and I kid you not, she went through the list in the survey, read the survey, asked me, like, just re-asked me the questions and basically said, well, since you don't have plans to do it and you don't want to do it, I'm going to let you continue training. Just come back if it gets worse. And I, in my mind, I'm like, it is as worse as it could be, you know, like, but you're that's terrified. why I'm here. Yeah. Like, so I was so frustrated with that. And so like just torn. Cause I didn't know what to do. So I was like, okay, I guess I'm just going to, and there was no drawn. That's the problem yeah. that I see across the board. And, you know, I, I recently had an experience uh, with the v- VA mental health as well. Um, you know, but conventional army in military as well is, Hey, come back to us if it gets better. Well, where's the tools right. that I could be working on in between this? Yeah. And you look at my chart, you look at the page that I filled out, yeah. and that's all you're basing. Your, I could have done this survey online. I know. And I could have literally, chat GPT could have told me the same thing. <laughs> exactly. I mean, they didn't have that back then, but Google could <laughs> yeah. have. You yeah. know, yeah. like yeah. I could have Googled my, my symptoms. Yeah, these are my DSM answers. <laughs> yeah. And they would have been like, yeah, you should probably see a mental health professional. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But the yeah. army mental health. I mean, well, from from that perspective too, and just to play devil's advocate, yeah. she knows that you're in flight training, and she knows that hey, like if you're not planning on doing it, like it's best for you to not talk to someone if you want to continue with training. You're right. So she she was doing you a service there. Yes. While doing you a disservice. Agreed. Like, yeah. And it really is going to come down to your decision at that point. Like, what was more important to you at that point, or what did you prioritize, or what did you see? Were you actually going to end up taking your life in the next couple of weeks, or could you make it through training? And you obviously did. Yeah. But that that decision, like that's that that's the question mark that um, we, we can op- often, you know, do a disservice to other people. Mm. And if it was somebody else in a similar position to you, say they were apprehensive to r- check that box. Yes, I'm planning on taking my own life. They said no when she asked, but that wasn't the truth. Right. right now, now she's done them a disservice, and that's going to lead to now you're putting them behind a multi million dollar asset. Yeah, yeah. With, with people in the back that is filled like yeah. uh, essentially a missile. You yeah. Know? yeah, yep. And, the lawn dart. Yeah. And and she absolutely did you a disservice because you know you with the way she presented that you felt threatened on your training at that point. So yeah. I'm sure you just closed off and you said yes, ma'am, I'm good to go. Okay, perfect. I'll come back. Yeah. And we. You know, you we often feel scared to say, "No, this is not going to cut it." I need a little bit more tools. Yeah, I didn't and, want to say that. And, no and, way. And you can't because yep. she literally put it black and white for you. Yeah. Of okay, well, I'm not going to kick you out of school. Well, that's the worst thing you could have said to me. You know, I'm coming to you for help, and you're not providing it. Yeah. Right. If it gets worse, right? Like, how is there no really, middle ground? What's you know, worse, like, me killing myself? Exactly. You know, I mean, yeah. that would have, yeah, that's that literally been, was the next step. And, and, like, and two, we, d- we don't think about that too. The professional, the behavioral health specialists need to recognize that out there of saying, this is a cry for help. Mm. You, you feel threatened on your job. You need to provide a safe space yes. for these guys to come in and work through them with those problems. Not read from a chart and say, you know, tell you about yourself. Yeah, <laughs> it's not especially work. if somebody like turns themselves in. Yeah. You know, yeah. drives themselves there, like yeah. when they know the stakes are high and they know, you know what I mean? So, mm-hmm. yeah. But yeah, to your point, she was trying to keep me in training, which yeah. you're right. Like, she, in her mind, that was probably her intention yeah. was, hey, like, this guy seems squared away. Let's keep him in training. Mm-hmm. But I also think there should have been some, like, let's follow up, you know, tomorrow or let's get you talking to somebody. Yeah. That won't ground you. Something mm-hmm. in between, you know. The, yeah. 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 So that's, so it gave me a bad taste with the, I mean, I already didn't want to go to behavioral health ever. ever. I yeah. didn't want to be in the parking lot, you know, yeah. unless I was out processing. No one does. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. so that gave me an even worse taste. And I was kind of like, all right, well, I'm not going back there. You know, that mm-hmm. they're not going to help me. Yeah. So you just, stuff it down for even longer. Yeah. So, um, and it was always like looking to the next milestone to mm-hmm. hope, hope it would get better, you know? Like, it yeah. was like, all right, let's get to third cab, then it'll be better. Let's go to Afghanistan, then I'll do my job, it'll be better. So it's kind of just always trying to That's justify. a great thing about the military as well, though, is we yeah. distract ourselves so well oh, yes. that 
we don't get hit until we're in our downtime, yeah. often when we transition out of the military. Yeah, for sure. Um, so that I th- honestly, I think that's what like kept me going, yeah. like looking back on it, other than like family and things like that, but just always having something next. What's yeah. next? What, mm-hmm. you know? There's always something next. To right? The like my situation yeah. will get better once this happens. And, it didn't, and but. How was it during those periods though? So you went to behavioral health during flight training mm-hmm. and here you are, you know, as a 160th pilot still dealing with the same things, you know, years later. Were you going through ebbs and flows? Was it pretty constant and steady? Or, or can you even like delineate between? Yeah, so I actually can. It was um, something really weird happened to me. Mm-hmm. So when I was in the regular army the whole time, I was having these like still depressive depression and suicidal thoughts. Mm-hmm. And then once I got picked up for the 160th, actually before that, so in Afghanistan towards the tail end, I started having these dizzy spells, like mm-hmm. unexplainable, just my body felt off kilter. It was bizarre. And I, I thought it was like an inner ear issue or something like that. Um, and I got that checked out and they said it was fine, but I started having these weird dizzy spells. And when I assessed for the 160th, I was, it was like at its worst during assessment week, which Mm -hmm. is not the time you want it to be. Um, it was just awkward. Like I felt like I literally had this feeling of I'm going to fall over all the time. Like Mm. we'd be talking right now and my body would just feel off and I would feel like, yeah, it was just weird. Um, Interesting. Yeah, so it was bizarre. But once I got picked up for the 160th, um, my depression started going away a little bit. So it wasn't it wasn't the constant intrusive thoughts. It was like more purpose driven. Yeah, and it was mm-hmm. when I'd be going to bed or something. Mm-hmm. You know, I'd I'd have those thoughts, but it was just because my mind was you know stagnant and I wasn't yeah. doing anything. Mm-hmm. But other than that, it was getting a lot better. But I was having these dizzy spells, so it morphed into this, mm-hmm. which is weird. And I in my mind, it wasn't like my mental health was improving and mm-hmm. now I was having some like physical something. Yeah. Like something was off with my body. I didn't think it was my mind still. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to kind of go like deep in the story here and the diagnosis and all this stuff and how it happened. Sure. But essentially I had, I, I had these dizzy spells for a long time. Um, and I, I didn't tell anybody. I was just holding it in the same thing because I was a pilot and it didn't happen when I flew, which was ironic. Mm-hmm. Or when I like, I don't know, never did. I don't know if it was the adrenaline or the focus or what, but um, so when I had the knee surgery, when I went and got my knee surgery, that's when my wife was like, hey, you need to like, since you're on a down slip already, you can't fly. You need to go talk to somebody and get this figured out. Mm-hmm. So finally did. Um, and initially everybody thought it was the same thing, like not mental health related, right? So got ears checked, neurologist did every test head to toe. Um, and then finally my flight doc was like, let's get you talking to the psychologist, you know, and just see what, see what happens. You know, yeah. they framed it as a performance enhancement, um, which I, I kind of struggle with now, like calling it that because in my mind it was like, okay, I can't disclose mental health problems because this is a performance enhancing, mm. you know, type of treatment, you mm-hmm. know, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So instead of like behavioral health, it was how can we get you optimal from where you are now instead mm. of diving deep and, you know, getting to the root of the problem. So did that for a long time. And I actually went and got a sleep study done throughout this process. Cause the psychologist was like, maybe it's sleep related, you know, cause I had daytime sleepiness. Mm-hmm. Um, So did that, got a sleep study and came out. I got diagnosed with narcolepsy Mm. from a civilian sleep doc Oh, as a pilot. That is not good. Not good, right? But the ironic thing is I was sucking so badly with these dizzy spells that it was like a relief. Like it was like, okay, now I have an explanation. Mm. Like I was maybe I'm having these micro naps and that's what's making my brain, you know, think I'm dizzy or I'm off kilter, you know? So I was justifying it in my head, like, okay, cool. Like now I have an answer. Yeah. You know? So Unfortunately, like a, like a low grade of, narcolepsy yeah, exactly. into stage one, two. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Like very mild, you know, like yeah. maybe it's just, I don't even know what's happening, but it's happening. Mm-hmm. So that's like a med board right away and a ZQ from flying. So, yeah. so now I'm on a downslip or well, still on a downslip. Um, and we start exploring an MEB the flight doc does. Um, 
and the army makes you take another army makes you do a sleep study with them because they have like a watch you have to wear for two weeks prior just to make sure all the data is correct. And you were actually sleeping before, you know, you don't just show up like I haven't yeah. slept in a week. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to sleep. You know? yeah. yeah. So you're not, you can't game the game, I guess, or game the system. So did the army sleep study and it took like four months to get the sleep study. And then it was like a month after to get the results. So it was just this purgatory forever. Yeah. Yeah. And by then, like my knee was almost recovered. So I could have almost been back in the cockpit. So I was really anxious to like figure out what was going on. Sure. Um, the army comes back, says I don't have narcolepsy. Mm. says I have no diagnosable <laughs> criteria, meet yeah. none of it. And so I'm like, what the hell, man? Like back to square one. Yeah, but yeah. I'm still grounded. Like they wouldn't put me on an upslip. Did you notice uh, like a sense of relief? When, once you notice the sense of relief, did you notice those some symptoms subside? No, so you still have the dizzy spells. Yep. Well, yeah. Well, that's that's just an indicating factor that it could be more physical than mental. Right. Yeah. For sure. And I actually got prescribed modafinil mm. well, after perfect. the first narcolepsy diagnosis. <laughs> Love modafinil. So that's a great <laughs> drug, yeah. but when you're having anxiety, <clears throat> yeah, that hides it. Intense. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So perfect. So the dizzy spells got a little worse, honestly. Yeah. But oh, yeah. And the shakiness and the anxiety yep. like yeah. does not make it easy as exactly. well. Exactly. So you're in a helicopter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Luckily I wasn't flying or else that would have been a bumpy ride. <laughs> Call that SAS three. Yeah. Or, seriously. Helicopter humor. Yeah. For real. <laughs> we had a pilot with tremors. He had physical tremors. Like his hands would shake and we called it SAS three. Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> That's God. safe. Real safe. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. So, <clears throat> um, I apologize. This is long winded. No, no, no. This is so information. the army docs. I don't have narcolepsy, so I go from yeah. having it to ha not having it, and still searching for answers. Um, the army would not do another sleep study, so my flight doc referred me to an outside sleep doc in Savannah for the third one, and I go and talk to him, and he doesn't have the watches that the army requires for the sleep study. So basically, if I did one with them, it would, the army wouldn't care. Yeah. Like it wouldn't be recognized anyways. Okay. So the last thing you can do is a lumbar puncture um, or spinal tap. And they test for some, this, uh, something called hypocretin levels. And that's like indicative of if you have narcolepsy, if you have elevated levels of it. Mm -hmm. So we did that and results came back and I didn't have it still. So now we're like, I'm really like, what the hell, man? Like, mm -hmm. That because I, I truly did think that was the answer, or I think I just hoped it was the answer, sure. Yeah, you know, yeah. I just wanted something and I wanted to be normal, mm -hmm. feel normal. Um, so then after that, this psychiatrist, um, I started meeting with the psychiatrist, and that's when we were like, All right, let's start treating. He was like, Let's start treating for anxiety because it might be that, and we've ruled out everything else basically. Mm. Um, so I'm down already, so I'm like, Okay. Let's, let's fix this. I'm, I'm sick of being like this. Let's try something. So I get on Lexapro, um, and I do start noticing improvements. It wasn't like extreme, but it, the dizzy spells would become more situational. Mm. So it was, um, I could recognize after the fact when it happened, I could be like, okay, like I was in this situation. This is why it happened, you yeah. know? Um, so, but the Lexapro wasn't like the answer cause it wasn't, that bet much better. It was just a little better. Mm. So we kept trying cocktails of drugs, you know, of course, you know, the story, um, finally get to effects her and symptoms got a lot better, like probably like 90% better. Mm -hmm. So it was very, very situational at this point. Okay. And it was a hundred percent like, okay, this is treating it, which was bizarre and took me a while to kind of accept. You yeah. Know? Um, but this psychologist, after that, so after we like established that this was working, she read the symptoms of panic disorder. And I was like, oh my God, like that's exactly what I've been experiencing. Mm -hmm. Like we've been talking for a year, you know? And like to her credit, she wanted to rule everything out first yeah. before jumping to a diagnosis like that. Like that was her reasoning. But I was just like, man, like that literally nailed what, what's been going on mm -hmm. with me. And yeah, that's really how I, so then I got med boarded for panic disorder and anxiety, mm -hmm. PTSD, all, you know, yeah, yeah. Like, they, they just lumped it all together. Um, but yeah, so, 
So the biggest lessons learned through that though is just like I let it get so bad yeah, because I held it in for so long Mm -hmm. because I was so scared to get help and talk to people that it got to that point. You know, like if I would have, if that mental health professional at Fort Rucker had just probably treated me or whatever, got me on a plan or something like none of that would have happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. So it's kind of bizarre to, to look back on it now. Let me, let me ask you this and it's, it's going to be a very pointed question. Do you now wish, or would you have changed what you said in 2016 when you first went to behavioral health? Now that you know where you're at now and all that you've gone through, would you have given up all of that that you've been through now, you know, being a 160th pilot, all that, is that something you would have given up to change it? That is a great question. And my answer would be no. But Mm. with that being said, the, I don't want people to take that as like, I'm not going to get help because, because the end result could have been much worse. Right. Mm -hmm. Yours happened to work out. Yeah. I got lucky. I mean, maybe not lucky, but a lot of things could have gone way worse than it did. Yeah. And you've, we've all heard the stories of that soldier. That's a stud, you know, that takes his life and you're, Mm -hmm. everybody's confused. Everybody's like, what happened, you know, and leaves behind his kids and wife and you know, the tragedy. Yeah. And like, that would have been me if I would have done it. You know, it would, everybody would have been like, dude, I had no idea. I would have yeah. never seen that coming. Even to this day, like, I haven't been really public about this except for the last month or so. And I have buddies texting me, like, dude, I had no idea. Like, mm-hmm. you yeah. should have said something. And I'm like, yeah, I know. That's the point. <laughs> you yeah. Know? That's the yeah. point of all of this. Have you had anybody reach out to you now that you're being more, more open about this and, and, say that they've been going through the same thing similar yes yeah crazy how a quick. lot of people crazy right and it's scary honestly and mind-blowing yeah how many people like once you open up they'll be like dude i know i've done that i've been through that too yep. yeah it's, or i'm going through that right, right. Now too. yeah it's crazy yeah best kept secret in the military right isn't that sad yeah there's the mental health so so yeah. what do you do now to help facilitate that heal uh, that uh, healing. So the medication is big mm-hmm. right now, mm-hmm. but I kind of view that as a band aid, you know, yeah. mm-hmm. as a short term solution for a long term problem. Yeah. Um, well, hopefully not a long term problem, but yeah. But you know what I mean? So um, my outlet right now is really working. I'm building a business right now and then working out and family. So mm-hmm. fantastic. Those are my real outlets. Also, when you're not in a set and setting, where you're going through an ample amount of experiences up, right, down, left, right, yeah. whatever it is, you're in a more stable environment. You could set a stable routine and just that alone yeah. has a tendency to really bring you out of that. For Especially sure. when you have the support system around you. And funny enough, talking about it the way you're doing now is probably the best therapy for you. It really is. It and is when you so when you free. get into helping people more, oh, yeah. that's when you really notice a difference. I mean, wh- when I I talk across the board for the foundation or whatever it may be on stage, I'll say things where I'm like, I should do better at that. You know, I I need to internalize that, and that is the most healing that that's happened for me. Is right. just talking to other people about it, mm-hmm. and you'd be surprised, and you're seeing this now at how willing and open people become when you give them that door. Because they want to be. Because yeah. it feels so good to actually like yeah. get literally years yeah. of burdens off your chest. Mm. And, and, and think crazy. about that too, is as you're sitting there in the parking lot of behavioral health in 2016, you were going through a slight amount of anxiety just thinking about talking about it. Yes. Mm. And now you could just open up about it on a podcast that reaches thousands and thousands of people. Yeah. I mean, that's huge. That's yeah. huge growth. And we have a tendency as people to not see the growth that we're doing too. And just incorporating that into where your journey is now is so empowering. That's a good point. And it was, honestly, it was terrifying like to yeah. even think of exposing this to people. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. Like all those negative thoughts come racing back. Like, what are people going to think? Yeah. You know, I had a good reputation. Now is it going to be tarnished? Now are people going to look at me as weak? You know, mm-hmm. all those things. Yeah. Where really the opposite's true. Like, yeah. I don't care what people think now, you know? It's yeah. whatever. I'm happier and my life's 
go, you know, on an upward trajectory instead of downward. So it's brilliant. Yeah. People it's awesome. are much more receptive they these are. days, especially with, with mental health. Cause people are starting to be more open about it. Like, Hey, I'm struggling mm-hmm. with that. And people are realizing, Oh, like the people I look up to my mentors or, or my idols or whoever it is like, Oh, these are just people. And they're going through the same exact things that I am. It's, it's less taboo. Yeah. Very much. Yeah. So, very it much is less so. taboo. And, yeah. and two, we, we talk about idolizing our leaders in the military but yet when they're more open about it, and th- this is a strength for our leadership mm. to open up about these things and say, hey, I have days like that where yeah. I have days, months, weeks, whatever it is, where I have suicidal thoughts. And when you tell your people that, all of a sudden you're like, you stop idolizing them so exponentially and saying, I need to stuff it down too. Like I'm the only one with this problem. Right. That's not the case. Yeah. Every single person that we talk, I don't care if a four-star general. Like we talk to these individuals that are like, yeah, you know, I have to be strong for them. Well, be strong for them by telling them that it's okay to seek help. Yeah, yeah. be a human. Yeah, you know? like you're not a robot. Exactly, and that's None the whole premise of this show as well is to showcase the stories of these individuals mm-hmm. that are not robots. There's a face behind the uniform. Yeah, right. You, you might fall in line and do the same thing and and have a really tough objective, whatever it may be, to go kill terrorists or whatever it is. But at the same time, that's not normal. And that hurts us on the inside to do that. And to be open and forthcoming about it is empowering be all our belief. For sure. And especially the, like when you see it at the most elite level, you know, like these mm-hmm. guys that are beacons of success yeah. and, you know, physical strength, mental strength, everything, you know, you don't get through the special operations, any special operations pipeline with a week, anything. Yeah. You know, true. You have that drive and you have that, you do have a strong spirit. Mm-hmm. And yeah, being vulnerable, things like that is terrifying, but it's so valuable. And I think if we can get that out to even like active duty soldiers, you know, just talk about it. Even the civilian, uh, civilian population, yeah. because now they get to see what they've idolized as well. Yep. They see the special operations, the, you have constant exposure to these movies, Oppenheimer, whatever it is. And you see these guys and you think, oh, they got it together. And sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And when we could associate similar experiences, similar physiological responses, yeah. it could help them throughout their journey as well. For sure. Very good point. Yeah. Because, yeah, they think of us as, you know, these robots, G.I. Joe, invincible people and... <laughs> No. You're still human. No. You, know, you still have human emotions. Like Best concept I could give you is grab a G.I. Joe uh, doll and bang it across the wall. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, Several exactly. Times. Rip that That's arm out. Traumatic, <laughs> traumatic brain injury, G.I. Joe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not the same. TBI anymore. Joe. Yeah, TBI <laughs> Joe. <laughs> yeah, that's good. So, um, so exactly. I, you know, I, I, love, I love that you're so open about it, especially coming out of the military this May, um, retired in 2023. Yeah. Um, and being so close to that transition period and coming out on top and recognizing these problems and finding solutions in place and now you're empowered to help others is commendable at the very least. Thanks. So thank you for what you do and thank you for sharing this story. Absolutely incredible. Is there anything that you would say to the audience maybe? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is just don't be scared to be vulnerable. Mm-hmm. You know, don't, it doesn't make you less of a person. It doesn't make you weak. It doesn't make you it, anything other than strong. Like if you get help you're, or whatever, if, if you talk to somebody, tell your best friend about it, like they're going to support you. Yeah. They're not going to think you're weak or weird or any of the stigmas that are out there. Like that's the biggest, I think, piece of advice that I could give to people mm-hmm. is even if you don't want to go to behavioral health because of their career, you know, repercussions that could happen or whatever, just get it off your chest and talk to somebody. Talk to someone. Nobody's going to think you're weird. Nobody's going to think you're insane. All those negative thoughts that you keep telling yourself why you don't reach out to somebody or talk to somebody is just yourself telling you that you're your worst, you know, advocate. Mm -hmm. So that'd be my biggest thing that I want to get out there is just fantastic. don't, Don't be scared, man. Fantastic. We, we, you know, Christian nails this on the head with every time is the oxygen mask theory. Yeah. Yeah. 
You yeah. can't help others if you don't help yourself. Exactly. It's, and and you have to you have to help yourself, fix yourself before going in, right? We can't function at 70, 60, 50 percent of yeah. what our capabilities are. We need to address those issues so we could get back, perform to our optimal levels, kick ass and take names. Yep. And don't That's let it. it get worse, right? Mm-hmm. Like don't let stop it, get worse. it right now. Yeah. Yeah. Attack it and then take control of your life again, you know. Yeah. The longer That's, you let it go, the the harder it is to turn around. You can still turn it around. For sure. It, it becomes exponentially more difficult. Yeah, that knife just keeps twisting, right? Yep. Yeah, That's it. Is. Multiple fronts to the battlefield. And the battlefield of the mind is a really, really important one. And I think over the last few years, we've really recognized the importance of that. Yeah. And we are addressing that in the military. Mm-hmm. You have these safe spaces where you could go to now without repercussion of getting fired. Exactly. Yeah. So and You might be grounded for six months, right. a year, but... In the longevity of your life, yeah. What is that? And look at the alternative, right? Like, yeah, do it. Do something that's life changing in a negative way, like mm. potentially for not just you but your family, right? Mm-hmm. Or be grounded for six months to a year, or whatever it is, whatever career they're right. in, or find a you know? new job. Right. Sorry. Right. You can't do this one. You'll still be okay. Yeah. You'll and you won't be dealing with that anymore. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. That's the intent. That's Where can we find yeah. you? At? Yeah, so I am on Instagram at Task Force Stigma. Um, so I'm actually writing a book called Stigma, and it's kind of over this whole premise of these stigmas in mental mm. health, mm. It, like towards mental health in your own brain. You know, the things that we tell ourselves that are lies and that are that uh, keep us from getting help. Mm. Absolutely, so, yeah. I love that. When's the book come out? Uh, I'm planning on this spring. Okay, yeah. Awesome. So I'm planning Fantastic. on this. We'll have to have you back on once once it comes yeah, out. Yeah, I can't yeah. wait. Absolutely. I can't wait. Tour. Yeah. Love it. Perfect. Well, thanks very much for joining us today, Nick. It was a real pleasure getting to learn more about you, and, and thanks for opening up. No, you guys too. Thanks for having me. It's platforms like this. You guys don't know how valuable it is to people. Well, you know? appreciate that. Seriously. Yeah, appreciate it. And appreciate difference. you coming on. You know, it's guests like yourself and the stories that they bring to the table that make this show possible and educate the audience, whoever they, whatever background they come For from. For sure. So thank you. Yeah. No, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Nick O'Kelly, ladies and gentlemen, this has been the Medevac Podcast. Thanks for watching today. Don't forget to head over to medevacpodcast.com if you want to get in touch with myself, Dave. Tell us who you want to hear from, what uh, stories or topics you want to hear about. And then go over to uh, social media, Instagram, at Medevac Podcast, M-E-D-E-V-A-C Podcast. Interact with that stuff. Let us know what you think. We'll see you next time. Until next time. Bye.